Um, my name is Kristen Swan. I'm very fortunate to be here introducing this esteemed team of experts and Janet Triken as well, our moderator for this session. Uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Sam Triken and Dr. Mark Ross. Um, I will be running around passing out a few more of the evaluations, which are very important. So we really ask that you fill them out and then I'll gather them at the end of the session. So without further ado, I think we'll get started. Kristen, thank you very much. Um, now I just need to make sure that's loud enough. Let's see, in the back, is that loud enough? Okay, good. And we do have two very esteemed gentlemen with us today, and uh, who over the years have shared so many information, so many stories that I thought maybe we can put them all together in one workshop. So, uh, so let's move along. During this workshop, you will be hearing and seeing stories related to the hearing losses of both men, and these stories have been selected because uh, they're meaningful to each of the men, and I should, I think they will be entertaining to you as well as educational. And we hope you enjoy these stories and that they prompt stories of your own if we have enough time at the end of today's workshop. And Mark, you will meet Mark first. And I'm gonna tell you briefly about Mark uh, because I know he wants to talk. Uh, he, his wife, Helen, where are you, Helen? Helen? Uh, Helen and Mark have been married over 50 years. He is a rehabilitative audiologist. Uh, he was a professor at UConn. He's now a professor emeritus from UConn. He was the director of Willie Ross School for the Deaf and an associate of the Rehabilitative Engineering and Research Center. And were these handouts, was this available to you online before? It is available to you online? from the website, from the HLAA website? Okay, pardon me? Yeah, okay, so uh, I'll go through this. Mark has had such a wonderful career as an audiologist. Received the Walkie Stone Award, a career award from the American Academy of Audiology. He is a fellow with the American Speech Language and Hearing Association, an award of honor for the Ac Academy of Rehabilitative Audiology. Uh, and he received his doctorate from Stanford where he and his wife Helen met. Earlier Mark had obtained both his Bachelor and Masters of Arts from Brooklyn College. Uh, there are books here that he has written. He's written a great deal. Uh, and many of you know him from his writings about technology in the Hearing Loss Journal. And now we begin with our stories. And I'm gonna step aside. Here is Mark Ross. Thank you. Yep. And so you don't have to speak into that, I just speak. I get a little embarrassed when I listen to people talk about me. Thank well, you. Sure. What I thought I'd like to do first is kind of go back into a little history and first, I'm old enough now to give a little bit of an historical perspective. So I'd like to start out with my hearing aids, 1952, and talk about the development from my personal perspective until now, wearing a cochlear implant. I got my first hearing aid in January 1952 in the Air Force from Walter Reed Hospital, who incidentally, Sam was also that same program. This was an all, rehabilita all rehabilitation program that the service provided for people who have, with hearing loss was identified in the service. His first hearing aid was a body-worn vacuum tube hearing aid, so two batteries, and it was probably something we laugh at now because it was so primitive. Actually, it did us a lot of good. We didn't have much choices when we got that hearing aid. We were in a service, I said, we're a hearing aid. We didn't go through the agony of having to make a decision regarding wearing an aid or not wearing an aid. We were ordered to wear an aid and we put it on and there it was. And for eight weeks, we got used to each other wearing hearing aids, accepted each other. 
That probably was the most valuable part of the program that I had. The body aids st stayed with me for a number of years, even though it was a an electroacoustic piece of junk, actually. It did a lot of good for a lot of people. It had a narrow bandwidth, a lot of distortion, a lot of problems with clothing noise, and uh, it was soon superseded by BTE hearing aids, behind the ear hearing aids, which were transistorized as opposed to a vacuum tube model. The uh, hearing aids themselves were not meant for profound or severe hearing loss. They were more for moderate hearing loss people, but as my hearing, personal hearing loss developed, I was able to meet. There was a technical development for every stage of my hearing loss. There was a technical development. At first, I had the body aid. As my hearing loss got worse, I had a behind-the-ear hearing aid. Finally, wound up with cochlear implants. So I've spanned the whole spectrum of hearing assistive devices, from body hearing aid to a cochlear implant. When the cochlear implant came out, we knew it wouldn't work. I mean, how could it work? Put electrode to stimulate the eighth nerve and bypass the cochlea, we knew it wouldn't work. And here I am with a cochlear implant and look around me. And the marvelous, marvelous of progression that we've made since, since the development of these hearing aids. The, uh, I lost my train of thought, so I'll go on for, <laughs> go on for. Let me talk about my first experiences wearing the aid at, at Walter Reed Hospital. Uh, the very first uh, experience I had with it was going to a USO dance. This is the body hearing aid. I had the wart and the harness under my shirt, went to the USO dance in Washington, D.C., and I was dancing with this young lady. And every time I got close and expected a sensation of some kind, I'd hear a clunk. I'm not sure what gave me the clunk. Tried again, had a clunk. Couldn't dance cheek to cheek, and I really <laughs> Turned out this little young lady had a body aid in the bazaar. And I had my body aid under my and, and under my shirt. And every time we got close, we produced an acoustic trauma. <laughs> one way to one way to get friendly. So I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I'm glad that was <laughs> Well that was my introduction to hearing aids in social situations. It was not uh, positive, but uh, actually that young lady forgave me. We never did find ourselves in, uh, as a, a couple because it was more to it than just hearing aids. You have to have more in common than just hearing aids. <laughs> One of the hearing does get you into trouble. When I was introduced to my de new departmental head at, at the University of Connecticut, he invited me to dinner for an, inter to, uh, for an interview. We had a number of drinks. I don't drink very much. Before dinner, after dinner. And then he put me up. I was being interviewed by him in his house. I woke up in the middle of the night with an awfully big hangover. I, I don't drink very much. I felt, well, I have to go to the bathroom. Turned out he had two teenage daughters, one in each room in the hallway. And the room was, the house was dark. I couldn't hear. I couldn't wander through the house looking for a room for you to relieve myself. Afraid I'd go into a girl's room. And uh, waited until morning until holding myself in until the light came on and I could hear and see. And uh, <laughs> that was the story that Johnny wanted me to tell, but I, I never did like that one. <laughs> well, I did like the one when I finally wore my hearing aid in Casablanca. I was probably the first person or second person in North Africa to wear a hearing aid. I have a body aid, 
uh, into the city where we take a train, where we take a bus from the Casablanca to uh, the Air Force Base. At the bus station in Casablanca, the kids are out there just wandering around trying to sell you things and pick your pockets and so on. And they're bothering bother most everybody, but they stopped bothering me when I pointed to my aide, took it out of my pocket and said, a radio, CIA from Washington, I broke, <laughs> I made his feedback, do Morse code. <laughs> I could stand at the bus stop and all the kids would be out and with the other guys and leave me alone. So hearing loss, the hearing aid did come in handy. Actually, in Africa, my hearing aid came in handy in another situation. We had two dogs living in my tent, Duchess and Princess, not Gladys. They're, much, they're not as nice as Gladys. <coughs> Duchess loved me. She had a crush on me. We lived in a tent, six, six cots in the tent, and Duchess and Princess. They belonged to the, he, they belonged to the first sergeant who was also in the room with me. Well, Duchess would jump into bed with me as I was sleeping. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, no circulation in my leg. She had just, she was a big dog, big boxer. As much as I loved animals, I couldn't go, go to bed with a dog sleeping on my leg all night long. I took the hearing aid, talked, in, talked into it, put, put the receiver by her ear and yelled at her, Duchess, you have to stay away from me, please. She should be, I associated a frightening experience with, her, with the uh, implant, with the uh, aid. When I go to bed at night, I put the aid down at the foot of my bed. She goes to the bed, look at, it, look at the aids, and then decide that she wanted no part of this. She, I conditioned her to reject, to, to be afraid of the hearing aid. Uh, Oh, there's that one. Okay, this is, this is something else. I forgot about this one. When I was in New York, not New York, when I went to Stanford, I was probably the first person in the field as a, as a professional audiologist to go through a training program with a hearing aid and a hearing loss. There were no other people wearing hearing aids in, who were professionals in the field at that time, not as far as I knew. So when I went to Stanford, the, the the departmental head saw my hearing aid, heard my New York accent, and made the association, this indeed must be due to the hearing loss. <laughs> he, said, he said, I want you to see Dr. Duffy tell me about your hearing, about your speech. Well, I saw Dr. Duffy, by Bob Duffy. He listened to me, he said, you know, you talk like you have a New York accent. Bob was from Brooklyn, he recognized exactly how I spoke. So Virgil Anderson, the departmental head, looked at my hearing aid, listened to my speech, made the uh, false assumption that one was due to the other. Uh, not, not to jump to conclusions, which he did. Well, what I did want to mention some things about was this is a... You're okay? You're I got plenty of time? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to talk about assistive devices. When I got my first hearing aid, that was the whole gamut of hearing assistive devices that we had, just the hearing aid, nothing else. There were no wake-up alarms, there were no telephone systems, no, no, nothing else but the hearing aid. At that, those days, I did a lot of talking. I uh, a lot of, went to a lot of programs. I'd be invited for a 9 o'clock session, an 8 o'clock session, and I had no way to wake up. They knock on the door, the, uh, I couldn't hear a knock. They called me on the telephone, I couldn't hear the telephone. So what I would do is every night I go to bed, I just would keep waking myself up. So I wouldn't get a good night's sleep before the uh, program began. When the program began, I was, <laughs> I was sleepy, sleepy eyed, and there I was, nine o'clock in the morning after not sleeping, doing, giving a program. It was not a good situation. I noticed this thing called the moonbeam, an alarm clock, visual alarm clock that was sold by uh, hearing aid company, Hal Hen in New York. It emitted a strobe light rather than a sound. I used to carry it with me, about the first assistive device I ever used. 
I go to I go to a trip. I put the mix in my bed, set the alarm when I wanted to. At seven o'clock or seven thirty, it would flash a light. I wake up, fresh, fresh, ready for the next program. I could get a good, decent night's sleep. It was a little thing, but it made a real big difference in my life. And now we have hearing aid devices, hearing assistive devices that we couldn't believe right now. We have telephone devices, we have alarm systems. And in my work, when I was active clinically, we always did three things for people who came into the clinic. We made sure they could hear on the TV that talking to some kind of TV listening device. We make sure that they could wake up and survive if there was a, a fire, that there was a smoke alarm that would wake them up either through light or sound or vibration. And that we had uh, telephone communication, which is most important, available to them. That they could communicate with a CapTel, or amplified phone. In those days, you had, didn't have CapTel. But we had a little, little amplifier that we put on the receiver of the aid of the phone. The, uh, from that, those three things is something everybody with a hearing loss, I think, had some kind of need for. To improve their work, to improve their reception on a telephone, to be able to hear and understand on the TV, and to be safe when you go to bed at night in case there's a fire. Beyond that, we have assistive devices now that when well, we look out down at the exhibits, we see manifold, many, many of them. And the point I've made in my writings over the years that a hearing aid often is not enough. When we give a, provide a hearing aid for somebody, we simply, we simply can't stop there and say you have all your hearing needs met. Most of us with a hearing aid, hearing loss, need some other kind of help. Uh, I think I have, did I run through my anecdotes? I don't know, we're gonna look, let's look. Got that. I like that one. And that was a good I one, like Casablanca. That. And you got your dog. Oh, that was the one. Yeah, that was my. With the, with the daughters. Oh, and you, uh, and you got that? Yes, we're good. Well, I wanted to do this and give Sam lots of time to talk, and he could do a much better job, and I can listen to him and relax, and I don't have to think about what I'm going to say next. So, Sam, it's all yours. Incidentally, I could, I do have, uh, I, I think I, I, do, I do have time to respond to some questions. Which I'd like to. We could do it. We could take it now. or take a little. I uh, have five more minutes for questions. So, do anybody have any questions about my personal situation, hearing aids, or what I was saying, Dana? Dana, Dana, it's, we're being videotaped. Can you? Mark, could you tell us if, uh, how you acquired your hearing loss? Okay. Well, I, I can tell you when I first detected it, I was 18 years old in the Army, right after the war, I was doing guard duty, and my partner on guard duty said, you hear that out in the field? I said, no, I don't. He said, here's the movie, Boom. there it goes again, you hear it? I said, no, I don't. Well, he could hear something I couldn't, he shot let loose a few shots. Next morning, we found a dead cow out there. So there was something there, but I couldn't hear it. But I put that behind me. But from that time on, I was progressive, I think. The, uh, when I was in the Air Force, I was in the fire department. And I'm not sure what happened, but I missed the fire call. To prove I wasn't gold breaking, I went to sick hall, wound up, with a, wound up in Walter Reed Hospital. I had, did have a hearing loss. So nothing very dramatic, maybe caused by acoustic trauma during my service in the army. I'm not sure. Well, I didn't know that story. Hmm. I, I never heard that story. Well, later, uh, later on, I recognized that I had a hearing loss when I went to radio school after my army service, and uh, my partner in work turned the oscillator up to 12, 15, 16,000 cycles. <laughs> I, he's complaining about the noise and screeching in his ear, and I, I don't hear anything. <laughs> so, uh, 
it's not, it's not real till it affects your social life. One of the things that we've always stressed in audiology, or should stress, it's not just the degree of hearing loss that matters, but it's the effect the hearing loss has upon your communication functioning. And this, uh, this, didn't, uh, this didn't affect my communication function until I was in the Air Force much later on. Actually, I, sh I should say, I didn't start my college career until 28. I became a hearing aid dealer while I was studying in college. For a year, I went out selling hearing aids, I'd knock on the doors, just a make old body aid I would sell. And one year, I sold one aid. I was not very successful at it. <laughs> you would get your leads from ads that they were putting in the paper, the Mako company would put in, put in the paper. And they would send you information in a plain white envelope so you nobody need to know you have a hearing aid loss. You can keep that shame to yourself. After a year of working, selling one hearing aid that my brother made the reference, the referral, uh, I came across to somebody who I was explaining my aid, the Mako aid, which sold for $200. And he said, here's this Zenith hearing aid, it sells for $50. What's the difference? between your aid and this $50 aid, so as far as I know, only the price. Well, I wasn't made to be a salesman if I couldn't recommend my system and said the $50 aid was just as good. So I decided to go a professional route and I went major into speech and hearing, so I'd know learn more about hearing when I was selling hearing aids. I just wound up accidentally an audiologist. I didn't plan to be an audiologist. And after, so that, that's, I kind of answered more than your question, but give me an opportunity to talk some more and use up some more of Sam's time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bruce. Okay, well, when did you get a cochlear implant? When did I get my cochlear implant? About 12 years ago. Uh, I was 80 years old. I'll be 92 next month. I was 80 years old, and I'm sorry I never went bilateral. I should have gone bilateral. But I, about four or five years ago, I thought I was too old for bilateral. And I wasn't, but that's what I thought. But um, this cochlear implant has made a tremendous difference in my life. I have only one. And I have some hearing in the left ear, so I don't use, uh, I don't use an implant in that ear. But the egg gives me some, bit, some awareness of sound. I depend upon the cochlear implant, and I still don't understand how it works so well. I just had a, have a former student, well, she actually I was on her examining committee for a doctorate, a young lady was born with bilateral profound hearing loss, been wearing cochlear implants all of her young life, just got a PhD at State University of Connecticut. And it's amazing. I can't believe the things I see now with some of these people who are wearing implants and wearing hearing aids. It's, it's such a marvelous difference. It used to be you go to a meeting like this, you could hear people who had congenital loss because you could hear it in that speech. But you couldn't hear with this young lady. You can't hear it now. And she's an audiologist. It's wonderful. Any, uh, yes. Um, I'll repeat the question if I could hear it. Dr. Ross, um, there have been so many changes in hearing health care, especially recently. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about um, how quickly more audiologists will begin to introduce a kind of rehabilitative model for hearing health care, sitting down with a patient and doing a really good needs assessment as the first step, um, and then going from there, relying on the audiogram, but you talked about communicative functioning being the most important part of hearing health care. So do you think that audiology is moving in the direction of providing that kind of service? I, you know, this is the heart of what I do or did for years. Audiology began more as a, as a, as a technical assist for the doctors and medical people to provide medical information for their diagno medical diagnosis. But as long as we had the information, but actually I say it should be, it began the all rehabilitation to take care of people in the service who lost their hearing during the war. 
but the, and that the medical testing was ancillary, secondary to doing the rehabilita rehabilitation work. Turns out from the very beginning that the medical aspect, the med medical model, took dominance. And the re rehabilitative model is secondary. Part of it had to do with economics, part of it had to do with lack of evidence to prove its efficacy. And part of it, part of it I think, is just not, not glamorous to be a therapist. So you, you, you're really asking a tremendous question. I think the rehabilitation, after you get a hearing loss, every one of you who has a hearing aid right now must have needed more when you got your aid, you wouldn't be here. You're here because you needed something else besides just a device in your ear. Or information, support, you needed something else. And we, as a field, we haven't, support, we haven't provided that something else. The function of this organization has been to try to provide some gap, some assistance in that area. So we're still working on it. Hopefully we'll be, we'll be there one of these years. I, I would like to um, really thank you and Dana here in the front row. I, I'm losing my voice, but um, I hope you can hear me. Um, because you both saved my life back in um, 2002 because I lost almost all my hearing with um, meningitis, and I had no idea about devices, and now they call me the device queen because I have every device known to man. But um, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart what you did for me back then in helping me to cope with, with my hearing loss. And now um, in our chapter, we show over 30 devices every month, and we made a manual on how to do it. So if any chapter would like to learn how to do that in their chapter, you get a lot of members from this. But you also just cry every month because you're helping people that, I'm sorry to say the audiologists haven't told them anything about these different things. So thank you so much, Mark, for what you and Dana did for me. That's a No, let me, let, me, let me thank you. I needed that by, for myself. It's important to know that I was some, well, let's not get too maudlin about this, but it's important to me to know that I've been of some use. Thank you. Oh, oh, my gosh. All the kids, all the families. Good job. All the kids, all the families, as well as the adults that Mark has helped over the years. Terrible. Good job. Um, no, yes, good. he has Very been good. so helpful. Excellent. Was excellent. All right, now for Sam. Sam has been married to me, his wife, for over 20 years. He's a psychologist specializing in hearing loss, as ma most of you probably know. He was a professor at Gallaudet University, Castleton College, and Penn State, the Barron campus. He also received the Rocky Stone Award. Uh, he has been a mental health advisor for HLAA. He's a fa he has been a faculty member on the Ida Institute uh, in Copenhagen, and the Ida Institute exists to improve audiology services around the world. Uh, he is a member of the National Register of the Health Service Psycho National Register of the Health Service Psychologists. Uh, he is a currently a member of the Pennsylvania Governor's Commission on Aging, uh, Council of Deaf and Hard of Hearing and the Western Regional Council on Aging in our state of Pennsylvania. Here are some of the books that he has written. Let's see, and Living with Hearing Loss, of course, has been the most important book that, uh, for, for both chapters and individuals. But we've also put out a book, uh, hearing Lo Living with Hearing Loss at School, and lots of information. Uh, is that what you think? Talking about how we respond uh, in situations where people misunderstand. He has videos. Uh, he has a video for communication rules, video for relaxation training for people with hearing loss, and his book, Did I Do That? All right, you're on. Uh oh Wish me luck. <laughs> luck. <coughs> and are you, you're all mic'd up, and this Thank is you. your button here. What do I, am I on? You have to wake up now. <laughs> <laughs> right here, it's your button. What do I do with it? Oh, that's the move. Yeah, okay. Oh, well, this whole thing started with me. With, 
about the age of 12, 13, something like that, I got spinal meningitis. And, uh, and I missed about a month of school. And, I, and you know, the reason it was only a month is that the family doctor said, Christ, don't tell them you had spinal meningitis. They won't take you back. <laughs> tell them you had the flu. So we did that. And I missed about, again, about a, a month of school. So I was in a, in a junior high school in Brooklyn. And this, I was in 7A1. And there were seven grades, seven levels of each grade. So 7A1 was like the creme. These were all the bright, motivated students. Seven, level seven of the grade meant that you might be dead. <laughs> uh, but as you went down, it was less and less. So somebody made the decision because I had missed a, a, a month of sc school to let me skip 7B because I was in a class that would skip a grade, but they put me back in 7 and in 8A4. Uh, so I went from 8, 7A1 to 8A4. And in 8A4, if a teacher asked a question and you answered it, you were dead meat, right? Because the, the, the ethos in that class was don't get interested in anything here in school, right? And if you do, you're a sissy and you're a ninny and all that. So what happened to me was that my grades went uh, When I got to high school, I spent five years in high school. Uh, because I still, at the end of five years, I still needed two classes. So the dean told me as I was leaving, Ralph Batt, his name was the dean, and he said, uh, uh, you can go to night school and finish these two classes. We'll mail you a diploma, but it don't matter because you're going to be in jail for a year, in a year anyway. That was my <laughs> parting shot from high school. So you can, And so I never knew and I still don't know today what happened to my academic career. Was it my hearing loss? Or was it the fact that I was in this milieu, this environment that was not supportive of academic achievement? I don't know. Probably some combination of those things. And I know when I was about 14, though, my, my mother took me to a family doctor to check my hearing. And he gave me the famous wristwatch test. You know that one? Tell me when you can't hear it. Well, at age 14, he was halfway across the room. And he's saying, you hear that? And I said, oh, yeah, right. I got it. So I passed that test. <laughs> Fortunately for me, for nobody else in the world, but for me, the Korean War hit in 1950. So by 1951, I thought that this is a way out because I was working in a job that was taking 12 IQ points every day from my brain. And, uh, and so I enlisted. So I was in, still in Brooklyn. And so I had to go report for my physical exam on Wall Street, on the Whitehall Street in Manhattan. So I went, and my physical exam to get into the Air Force uh, consisted of, for the hearing test, somebody came, there were like 150 of us standing in our jockey shorts in a line on this hallway, and some guy came down a row, and he said, can you hear me, can you hear me? Can you? That was the hearing test. So, yeah, yeah, I hear you. So, uh, so I went through basic training finally, and the hearing, and I, I applied for this, what, what, what do you want to do in the Air Force? And I decided I wanted to be a control tower operator. And so in order to get to control tower school, you had to have a physical for vision, hearing, and speech. Everything had to be A1. So I go to get my hearing test, and the corpsman who was giving me the test asked me, do you know how to run this equipment? And so I would tell him, you let me know when you 
when you get, put the thing and when you put the sound in, and I'll let you know if I hear it. So I passed that test. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I go to Biloxi, Mississippi for a couple of months of training and uh, air traffic control school. And at the end, I have another hearing test and another guy who is not familiar with the equipment. So I pass that. <laughs> <laughs> so I get overseas in Germany and I'm working on a small air base. And again, this is 19, now it's 1952. So we were into a lot of stuff. We were, we had the air traffic support for Berlin. Remember all the stuff that was happening with the Russians and Berlin. And uh, um, so I was working in a control tower and there were <coughs> 42 control tower operators in our squadron and we were authorized to have 12. So all, all of a sudden somebody found out, hey, we got, I was working one day every eight days. And so we found out, somebody found out and shipped us all out. So they shipped me to Frankfurt where I was in the air traffic control center which means that you're in a little teeny room with no windows, you're wearing a headset and you got a microphone and you are relaying air traffic information from all over Europe. So somebody calls me from Vienna, I'm mean, sorry, from Amsterdam, saying they have a flight with a flight with the VIP on board <coughs> going to uh, Munich. They don't say Munich, they say BDX, right? And so unbeknownst to me, I call Vienna and tell them to expect this flight with a VIP on board, which means they have to have people out in class A uniform to greet the, you know, little parade to greet this. So what happens in Munich, this flight with the senator on board lands and nobody even knows it's coming in, so they're not prepared. And in Vienna, they're searching the sky, so you know, where is this airplane? So they decided I better get my hearing tested. <coughs> so they put me in a hospital, and uh, I was in the hospital for like three months and the, uh, their uh, ENT physician had rotated back to the state so it didn't have one. So I'm just sitting in the hospital every day, but I learned how to play pinochle while I was there, which was good. <laughs> Finally, they sent me back to Walter Reed. I got to Walter Reed probably less than a year after he left, and, he, and a, less than a year before he came back the second time to that program. Thank you. So that was two, a two-month program where you learned uh, how, how to deal with your hearing aid. Uh, so I went from there back to active duty in the uh, same base he went to, Bowling Air Force Base. <coughs> but they decided air traffic control was out for me, so I became a supply man because apparently you don't have to hear anything when you're in supply. So I got my hearing aid and all that, which I think I was the only guy I knew in, in the Air Force at that time uh, on, on the base that had a hearing aid. And I would go home on weekends to Brooklyn, and there was always a bar where all the guys hung out. So I would walk in the bar uh, you know, in, a, the, the, in the evening, like on a Saturday evening, and then I would be greeted with the chorus of, hey there, you with a smile on your hearing aid. <laughs> so that, that was the uh, kind of uh, reaction I got from my friends, who, which to them it meant nothing that I had a, a hearing aid. It was not a big deal. So um, fortunately, I, I qualified for uh, disability uh, from the Air Force, and part of that was I qualified for vocational rehabilitation. 
So I went to a vocational rehabilitation counselor who saved my life, Colonel Ketchum, his name was, I'll never forget him, because he gave me all these tests and all that, and he said, you're going to college. And I said, you're crazy as hell. I mean, look at my high school. I was five years in high school, and I, they mailed me my diploma. I said, I don't want anything to do with trying to have education kind of stuff. He said, you're going to college. He said, if you don't go to college, yeah, so I'm going to put you over my knee and spank you. <laughs> That's exa his exact words. He said, you bring in your wife. I was married at that time. Not to Janet, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> anyway. So because he was so convinced that I could do that, it allowed me to con consider that maybe I could succeed. So I went to college. And I was in university for 12 years, actually. I, I did an a AA degree, a BA degree, an MA degree, and a doctorate, and all in psychology. And I have to tell you that in 12 years of university training, I heard nothing about hearing loss, nothing. And I can tell you the same is pretty much true today. It's not in training of a lot of professionals. It's not in training for uh, physicians. The effects of hearing loss on people's lives and on the lives of people we communicate with. It's not in training for psychologists, blah, blah. In some few instances, it is for deafness, for people who rely on sign language. So this Gallaudet University has a doctoral program in psychology, but it's for people who are focused on people who rely on sign language. For hard of hearing, there's really not much around for in people trained for education, for psychology, social work, all of that just doesn't exist. So we can't assume that if you go or you re refer somebody to a lot of professionals that they understand what the impact of hearing loss is on people's lives, you, you have to educate them. You have to educate them. Okay, where did I get to then? Oh, and I have to push that button. Yep, push away. <laughs> Which button? That. Oh, sorry. We did that, yeah. Okay, so I finished college. I go to teach in Vermont in a college, one of the state colleges there, Castleton State College. So I did that for seven years. And then I decided I want to do some more clinical work. I was doing some part-time clinical work up there. So I dropped out of that and went to... Uh, do full-time clinical work, and I did that for about another seven years. And then one day I woke up in the morning and I said, you know, when I was teaching college in Vermont, I was working actually about 20 hours a week uh, for nine months out of the year. And now I'm a professional psychologist and I'm working eight hours a day, five days a week. Something wrong with this. <laughs> So I decided to look for another university position, and I found one that was available. I was living in Maryland near DC, and I found there was a job opening at Gallaudet University, about which I didn't know much, except it was a school for deaf people. So I applied, and I think because I had hearing loss, I got accepted. And so there I was at Gallaudet, teaching classes in sign language, which I didn't know, <laughs> which is a very interesting experience. Students were coming up to me on the, on the campus and saying, what are you doing here? You're taking the job of a deaf person. You shouldn't be here. And I had to agree with them. So, but somebody told me about Rocky Stone. So I went up to HLA, at that time SHHH, self-help for hard of hearing people. <coughs> and I met with Rocky Stone. 
And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm a Gallaudet, and because I'm really not, I don't have enough sign language to really be teaching many classes, I'm mostly doing stress management classes at night with faculty, staff, students, anybody who wanted it. And he said, why don't you come and do one here at, at, at SHHH? So I said, okay, so we agreed. I would do one two hours a week uh, for eight weeks. And we had 10, 12 people who were staff members and volunteers. And we would sit around. And at this point, this is 1983. I've been wearing hearing aids since 1953. How many years is that? 30 years. I knew nothing about my hearing loss. I knew how to put batteries in my hearing aids. I knew if I didn't wear my hearing aids, I wasn't hearing much, but that's it. I knew nothing about the impact of my hearing loss on my life. So we sat down two hours a week for eight weeks talking about what kind of problems do you experience related to your hearing loss? And you're a hearing person and say, what kind of problems do you experience related to his hearing loss. So I'm starting to hear problems from people with hearing loss, problems from communication partners. At the end of eight weeks, we voted, let's go another eight weeks. So we go another eight weeks. That group ended up going 32 weeks. We went for 32 weeks, sitting around table, talking about what are the problems we experience, what do you do about it, what's helpful for it, and then I'd have to run back to the university and go into the archives to find out what other people had written about what you should do to help people with hearing loss, and there was nothing. So I, that's why we had to write these books. Communication rules, did I do that? Uh, problem solving in families, those kind of books so that we'd have something in print that we could relate to. And it all came from our daily experience living with, with hearing loss. Um, <clears throat> so we, and then somebody in Baltimore heard about the group that we did after we were doing it about 10 weeks. And we started a group in Baltimore. We met two hours a week. And we ended up going 24 weeks. So again, the same thing, just going around for two hours talking about what are the problems you experience, what can you do about it if it's helpful? And somebody would say, I have a problem. I had a problem last night. I had a problem in a restaurant. I'm sitting with four friends, and people are talking. And I don't know what they're saying because the music is playing and blah, blah, blah. I couldn't understand the waitress, blah, blah, blah. And so we talk about, for, for maybe 40 minutes, we talk about what other people have done. And then we get a list of things that one could do, and I give it to you, and I say, your job is to go back to that restaurant this week, one night, with the same people or as with, with another four people, and then come back and try these things, and then come back next week and tell us what happened. So that's how all this stuff got in these books about what was people's experience in trying different kind of strategies and procedures. So where do we go from? Let me move you on from here. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Well, that's so the one. So you met my boy, that's yeah. this one here. Uh, oh. 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 Well, part of this thing was then I got to be very smart <laughs> about my hearing loss, right? So I got to know everything. I'm a guy with a hearing loss. I wear hearing aids, and, and you can't fool me. I know what to do in all situations. So I fly into California. We're going to do a week's workshop at the School for the Deaf up in uh, Riverside, California. And <clears throat> so some, somebody from the school had driven down in the car to pick, us up at the air, pick me up at the airport. So we're driving back. She's sitting in the back seat in the middle. I'm sitting in the back seat next to the window. So I want to make a conversation with her. So we passed this big building. And I said, 
I said, what's the name of that building we just passed? And she said, it's not very far. And I said, no, 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 pardon me. You didn't understand what I asked you. What I asked you was the name of that large tower-like building that we just passed. And she said, it's not very far. She's getting cranky. And now I'm getting cranky. <laughs> I said, I want to solve this. I want to know the name of that building that we passed back there. And she said, it's Knott's Berry Farm. <laughs> <laughs> and the point of the, telling that story was I've been doing this work with people who have hearing loss for 12, 15 years, and I thought I knew everything. You never know everything. You never know everything. There's something that's always going to get you. So we have to be prepared for that. So if somebody, if we respond to somebody and we see a look on their face like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Just figure out that we misheard what somebody said, all right? And check it out. Check it out. You never get ahead of the game 100%. That's the, but that's the name of living on planet Earth, right? Has anybody here ever been 100% ahead of anything? No. That's not our... So as part of all this, part of all this, what I want to say is that we did get to write a lot of books and did some videotapes that are, are helpful for people. One of, the, oops, one of the books that uh, I brought with me that I, is a great composite of the result of 30 years of doing this work with people who have hearing loss and their communication partners. We finally culled it out and put together a book where there's, there's several sections in this book, five or six sections. So your job would be you and your spouse or whoever you are living with would be to take the first section and to work it for a week. You do what you're supposed to do as a person with hearing loss. She or he does what he, what they need to do as a communication partner. Do it for one week, then sit down together and talk about what happened. Has there been improvement? If not, why not? Troubleshoot it. Then move on to the next section. So it's a workbook. <coughs> if you do everything that's in this book, most people say that communication problems go way down, go way down, and hearing loss becomes quite livable. Do we have that? <coughs> Excuse me. We yeah. also have a cold. <laughs> so then what I find out is this, working with people, including looking at myself, is that I know what to do in a communication situation, and I know other people know what to do in a communication. They've been through it. But when they get upset, when they get emotionally aroused, it goes out the window, and they start to respond, react and do things that they end up saying, I wish I hadn't done that, or I wish I hadn't said that, but it's too late. So what we see and we see this much more generally than just with hearing loss, is that when people get emotionally aroused on, with anger, with anxiety, fear, those kinds of uh, emotions, it shuts down the cognitive processes. So your brain is not functioning the way it would function normally if you didn't have the emotional issue. And so I turned around and wrote another book, calling together what I could find researching what other people have done to help with emotional, negative emotional arousal. And actually, this book just came out this year, at the end of last year, came out in December last year. It's called Hearing Loss and Emotional Regulation, Building Resilience, so that when you find that you are beginning to get upset about something right in the beginning, when you find those <coughs> signs within yourself, it's time to 
Change what you're doing. Change your breathing, for one thing. Change other things to calm all that down so that you can think straight and do what you know is effective and that works for you. Uh, so we have those books as well. And if, if anybody's interested in them, we will have some for sale at the end of this if anybody wants that. Um, so let me open up to you for any question that you might have at this point, or just if you want to say, oh, I don't have a question, but that was pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Thanks, I saw on um, your uh, notes here a reference to Dr. J, an anecdote having to do with Dr. J. Dr. J. I saw that. I was just saw. curious about that. And I wrote that. You wrote it. Okay, no, let's go back to it. No, there oh, and I want, what I wanted to say about a Dr. J was that 20 years ago, 20, one of the benefits of doing this work, 20 years ago I went to Seattle Washington to do a five-day workshop and this audiologist came in to hear to see what this turkey had to say about hearing loss <laughs> and uh, and she got interested in what we were doing what we were discussing and invited us all the, all the participants in this workshop for dinner at her house and then invited me out for dinner, you know, for the two of us, so she could pick my brains about some of the stuff I talked about. And then I, my fortune is that she married me. <laughs> and so this is one, this is a J thing. This is. This is that, that uh, your professor who made that remark to you. It's an embarrassment. Do you remember? That they, she said, you did such a good job for someone with a hearing loss with that hearing aid. Oh, yeah. Oh. No, thank you. Yeah. It, the only experience, I said that in, in 12 years in university, I never heard anything about the research-wise about hearing loss or anything like that. But one time, uh, one of the uh, professors who I had had, it was Dr. Johnson, who I had had a number of classes with in a seminar when I was in, in my doctoral training in a seminar, uh, I, I came in and, and she announced to the rest of the group in the seminar that, um, that she was so pleased that I had been doing so well despite my hearing loss. And she meant to be very positive and pay me a compliment, but I get so embarrassed by that uh, that mention because that was back in the days before I knew anything about HLA or or uh, or uh, eight or uh, self help for hard of hearing people or anything. I mean, today, I mean, that would roll off. Uh, I would be grateful for that compliment, but at that time, any mention of my hearing loss was not uh, welcomed by me. And I think the same may be true for many, many people to their detriment because it, it prevents them from having discussions with people who may, that, who, who may be able to provide them infor information to be helpful for them, or at least the opportunity to talk about it. What is it like for you? Because you know, for some of you who have been through years of having a hearing loss and not talking about it to anybody, what a, it becomes such a burden to keep that in, locked up, trying to hide it from other people. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, first off, I want to thank you both for being such um, inspirational leaders in getting the word out about hearing loss for so long. Uh, Dr. Mark, I met you last year when you were honored at the Center for Hearing and Communication in New York City. And right. So I appreciate you being here. That's wonderful. Um, my question is this. Um, those of us in this room know about the problem of stigma, and most of us have found a way to 
accept our condition. I have a friend in the New York chapter who cannot believe that the organization has been around for so long and still cannot get the word out to the community at large. The public, for the most part, as you know, is still clueless. Um, my question to you is, and this is a reason why so few people have hearing aids who have hearing loss. Uh, the manufacturers would rather work with the audiologists than concentrate on getting the word out in terms of education and not marketing. I just wonder what you think about stigma and how we can deal with it more effectively. You want me to start and then I'll give it to you or do you want to start? You start. <laughs> <laughs> I was, afraid, I was afraid you were going to say it. No, it's a wonderful question because there's a gentleman, <coughs> an audiologist in Montreal, who has written a book on stigma and hearing loss. And what is his name inside of Montreal? JP. JP. Yeah, JP what? Gagne. Hmm? Gagne. Gagne. Uh, JP Gagne, G A G N E, <coughs> out of Montreal, has written a whole Took the treatise three of us to on. Do that. <laughs> on, uh, on that. And we know that, for example, <clears throat> among people over the age of 76 in the United States, 50% of them have hearing loss. Of the 50% who have hearing loss, only 25% of those have hearing aids. Of that 25% who have hearing aids, only 12% wear them on a regular basis. So you're talking about uh, people, even those who have the ability to overcome some of the effects of hearing loss, uh, don't stay with it. We lost us. Did we lose us? We lost. Uh, Peak oil. Peak oil. So the loop. The loop. The loop. Oh, is the loop off? I'm, I'm also aware of the time. I think we need to stop it. 3.30 here, and it's 3.33, so oh. okay. we may have to wrap up. Okay. Um, it's a good question, but if you look at that Gagne book, it's very good. <coughs> and, it's, and the stigma is such that people who view people with a hearing loss, including the people themselves who have hearing loss, view th themselves as being less competent, being a pain in the butt to talk to, those kind of things. So the stigma is real in the United States and in many parts of Europe as well. If anybody's interested in a book, we got some, I brought some, but I think we have to be out of this room, right? Wait but uh, and I, have one, I have one thing I wanna say. Okay. Oh, Sam and our dog, Doris, uh, and I got on the cover of the journal magazine uh, two years ago, I think, three years ago. And I was very excited to be on the cover of the magazine, and I called all of our radio stations, all of our television stations, I called the newspaper. Nobody was interested in covering a story on us and hearing loss. I was pretty amazed at that for, uh, for a national magazine to have the to be on the cover, and they're and I live in a very small, and they really should be, have been much more interested in us, uh, and they were not. They were simply not interested in talking about hearing loss. I want to thank. Yes. I want to thank Janet and Sam and Mark for your comments. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. I didn't give you <coughs> And our, yes, uh, definitely our cart reporter. Thank you very yes, much, thank Megan. You. Very nice job. Thank you. thank you. I didn't give you a chance to respond to that last. I didn't hear the question, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>